you, uh, Dr. Sabu. Good evening to everyone. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Sabu for giving me an opportunity to speak on uh, a topic which is going to have a lot of relevance to most of us in India very soon. Uh, so let me start by saying health is wealth. It's an age old adage which applies to individuals. It applies to societies. It applies to even a country. Just like you and me feel committed that we have to allocate resources, allocate finances for the health care of our family members, the government is required to allocate resources in the form of uh, manpower, in the form of facilities like hospitals, nursing homes, availability of medicines, etc., for its citizens. It is the government's duty to do that. And the healthcare scheme which government would set up should be inclusive to all sections of the society, should be uniform, should be comprehensive, and at the same time affordable. This is what every citizen wants, and that's what the country wants. Our population is 136 crores, and if you have to set up a healthcare system which meets all these requirements, which I just mentioned about, you require a humongous source of resources, which presently we don't have. And there are some serious challenges in get generating these resources. Many other countries also have faced similar problems. And they have taken up the issue. Of course, they didn't have so much of population, but they have faced the roadblocks which were there for the healthcare systems by bringing in technology, by bringing in digital technology. So India has also launched a digital mission in 2020. I don't know how many of you are familiar with it or heard about it. We're going to discuss that today. And this initiative, which has been taken by the government, uh, is something very aspiring uh, for them to realize. I think they are looking at a huge target to be achieved. I think it's a very ambitious target. I've asked a question in my title of the talk. Is it too ambitious for us to achieve this uh, in India? Let us discuss this. To make it easy in understanding and also enable anyone who wants to view it later, I have structured the presentation in four parts. Essentially, you can do installment viewing uh, so that for 10, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, you can see one part. The first part is, what is digital health? There are many definitions of digital health, but I will share with you what the international opinion is and what we feel in India is. The second part is, what is India's present health scenario? What are the various parameters which define India's health scenario today? The third part is, what is India's proven prowess to develop a dedicated digital platform for healthcare? We don't have it now in full measure, but do we have the capability to do this? We'll discuss that very briefly. And the last part, is on the digital mission itself, how it has started, where it has reached, what is left to be achieved. And then you can decide, is it too ambitious or no? So with this, I upload my presentation. Sabu, I'll just share my presentation. Uh, can you see the presentation now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, okay, fine. Right. So is India's digital health mission too ambitious? This is the topic. So let us first go to 
a very brief introduction. I told you about India's population, 132.6 crores, requiring huge resources. We are a 3.5 trillion economy, almost 3.5, not reached there. But we are able to allocate only 2.1 percentage of our GDP for healthcare, which today is meeting only 42 percent of the expenses. The remaining 58 is coming from somewhere else. So let us see that. Citizens are paying out of their pockets 47 percent for their own health care. You go to a private hospital, you get a huge bill, you pay it. That is a part of this 47 percent. And the remaining 11 percent is coming from some donations, some insurance, uh, etc. Now, can the government identify a suitable technology by which per, per capita cost? Cost is brought down. At the same time, coverage is more. So you enhance the coverage and also bring down the cost. Then you will be able to make it more affordable for the citizens. And can India do it ourselves? Or you need to look at some other country? For this. this is the topic which you're going to discuss. I'm going to the first part, that is, what is digital health? Digital health is the intersection of healthcare and digital technology, what I've shown in the diagram. So the DH, I'll be referring to as DH here and after, should be as large as possible. So that is the aim, to make sure that you're able to bring more healthcare aspects into digital technology field. It can be in diagnostics, it can be in monitoring, it can be in telemedicine, uh, it can be in treatment management, etc. So let us look at, I told you the intersection, and it should have the speed, scalability, accessibility, inclusiveness, and uniformity of digital systems. Digital systems have inherently these qualities. So you take these qualities of the digital system, these are positive aspects, and bring it into DH. And at the same time, make sure the data is protected. The individual's health data is protected and secure. But the macro trends which are happening can be given to policymakers to decide whether uh, a different program needs to be launched or a different policy needs to be made. Very recently, if you've seen yesterday's paper, they said Lancet has come out with a publication saying, in India, diabetes is prevalent by so much percentage. It's a macro data. And the government can look at it and see how they can reduce the uh, prevalence of diabetes amongst the population. I'm just explaining to you that. And this area of intersection, as I showed you, should be as maximum as possible to get the best benefit. So let us look at what all aspects in healthcare have been digitized so far in the world. First, they went for creation and sharing of medical records in digital domain. That's the time when digital computers started coming in late 80s. Then 90s, they started storing all these medical records in digital domain, patient-wise, which can be consulted by doctors, which can be referred by patients to some other doctor, etc. Then X-rays became digital. Then ultrasound became digital. Then the MRI became digital. So all these diagnostic tools became digital. Then telemedicine came so that you can speak to the doctor through uh, your com electronic communication and you're able to get advice from him. You're, he's able to see your digital x-ray. He's able to suggest your treatment. A prescription will come by, uh, by the digital domain. Then they started having equipment for remote monitoring of patients who are lying in the house. 
whose vital statistics, whose parameters are monitored through suitable digital equipment and through a modem, it goes to the hospital. So the patient doesn't have to come to the hospital. Maybe he's a very old person who can't stand the strain of being hospitalized. So he remains at home and uh, the doctors from the hospitals are able to monitor. Then robotic surgeries came. They also digitally controlled. And that is very quite prevalent uh, in many hospitals in India. Then came wearables and ingestible. That means you wear something on your wrist, wear something on your neck and monitors various aspects of your parameters, maybe blood pressure, uh, heart rate, pulse rate, etc. And you're able to refer it back to your doctor wherever he's sitting. Or you're able to have a, a medicine, a tablet-like thing, which has got uh, RF connectivity with the outside system as an ingestible, and that goes inside your body to make many measurements of what is your internal parameters. Similarly, virtual care has come. There are uh, artificial intelligence which has come in, which is able to do virtual care, data analytics. And there is a software which has got developed recently as a medical device. I'll just give an example. There is a patient who has a problem of snoring and he gets short of breath while he's asleep. So there is a software which has been made to the medical equipment which monitors his breathing rate and when there's having sudden difficulty in uh, taking the breath, then a small uh, mechanical gadgets, which is fitted to his hand, will slightly uh, wake him up, shake him up, and he changes his body portion from left to right, and he stops snoring and is able to breathe back properly. This is totally done by the software and the equipment. This is something which they have recently started doing, Similarly, they are doing a heartbeat also, uh, which can parallelly alarm the nurse on duty or the doctor on duty. So with all these developments in digital domain, in your healthcare equipment and healthcare process, can you administer digitally healthcare? Can it become a part of e-government? Like many other things have become a part of e-government. So let's look at that. The digital absorption or the digital adoption by a country depends upon three factors. One, there should be good infrastructure. Two, the population, the citizenry should be knowledgeable enough to use the digital domain that they have basic education, they are uh, not afraid of computers or digital equipment, uh, which are many times unmanned. And the third part is they should be able to utilize the services available. This adoption index was done over many countries. Denmark is number one. Finland is the number two. Of course, their populations are very small. India is 105 out of 193 countries in the world. This survey has been done by UN. And our score on electronic e-governance is pretty low at 0.59. Very low for infrastructure because our infrastructure does not cater for the entire uh, length and breadth of the country. Our human capital is also not so savvy with digital gadgets. That is at 0.5, but our utilization is very high. Whatever is made available, we are using. So are we ready to utilize healthcare through a digital platform? What has been the various e-governance uh, modules which have been given and where does healthcare figure in that? Let's have a look at it. These are various modules which are in the e-government and I will quickly go and tell you how it has been utilized. The highest 
utilization of e-government service is on caste certificate in our country. 64% is the utilization uh, people use for caste certificate, then they use it for income certificate, followed by domicile certificate, and healthcare is not in top 10 today. So healthcare needs to come into the digital domain and make it attractive for citizens to engage in healthcare aspects through digital domain. That is the aim which we are looking at. So if you look at today's uh, healthcare responsibility, healthcare's responsibility is with the state governments, with the central government's funding for uh, medical education, part of it, capital projects for new hospitals, AIMS, uh, et cetera. So central, and also for many other schemes which the central government extends. So if you look at this graph, which I've shown you, 42% is spent by government today on healthcare. Only 42%. The remaining 47% is by citizens themselves. They're spending money out of their pockets. And the, the remaining is around 10, 11%, which is coming from insurance and uh, uh, various uh, donations and some sponsorship, et cetera. So our allocation in GDP, which comes to 5.88 lakh crores is not enough. We require almost double of that. And we don't have that much of money in the country to make sure that we pay for everything from the government. That is why citizens have to pay out of their pocket. And per capita expenditure from the government side is only 4,300 rupees per citizen in a year. So this is pretty low. And this compared with many other countries in the world, this is very, very low. 4,300 is just coming to around $56 at the present rate. While in other countries, et cetera, it is in US, it is something like $11,000 per capita. Or in Denmark and Finland, which we saw there, number one and number two, it's around $7,000 and $5,000 per capita. So we are pretty low. Our availability of finance are low, of course. Our cost is also low. Costs in those countries are also high. So it may not be appropriate to make a comparison one is to one with what it is, but definitely we are much lower than many of the Western countries. So there is a need for us to allocate more resources and the amount of resources can be better managed for reach, for coverage, as well as for cost through digital technology. So that is what digital health is looking at. Managing technology, managing healthcare, so that it is available to all the citizens at affordable rates. So let's look at what is the healthcare landscape in India today. There are five A's, the national health policy of 2017 is identified. This health policy is still in vogue. Uh, I think last month, uh, there was a new health policy 2023 released by the government. Uh, the cabinet has approved it and it has been released, but that does not talk about the healthcare or the various aspects of the health of the population. It only talks about manufacture of medical devices in India, and they are going for a productivity linked incentive for them. So let us not look at 2023 health policy. Let's look at 2017 health policy, which has been made by the country in line with sustainability development goals of UN. So the present policy has five important aspects. First, increase awareness, health awareness of citizens. Why, whatever means you want so that they are imbibing correct practices, healthy habits, et cetera. That's the first thing, awareness. The second is provide access. 
to all citizens. And third is overcome absence of healthcare manpower in many hospitals, especially in rural areas, primary health centers, you find healthcare manpower is not adequate and very often a high percentage is absent. So this has to be overcome by making a career for a healthcare person in a rural area more attractive. Render affordability of treatment. That is a fourth A. And last one, ensure accountability of health institutions for providing healthcare, comprehensive manner, in a reasonable cost, and also making it accessible to all sections of the society. So just remember awareness, access, absence, affordability, accountability. These are the five A's of our national policy. And when you look at the key parameters of health of a country, it is population rate, fertility rate per woman, death rate, maybe per thousand people, what's the death rate, birth rate similarly, infant, infant mortality rate, maternal mortality rate, and life expectancy. These are seven most important parameters for considering how our uh, present uh, population of India is. So I'm going to make a comparison between these parameters of 2010 and 2020. You can have a look at it. Uh, population rate has come down. Uh, fertility rate has come down. Death rate has come down. Birth rate has come down. Infant mortality rate has come down. Maternal mortality, everything has come down and life expectancy has increased. This is the average life expectancy between man, male and female. Female is more than 70. Male is likely less than 69. That's why the average is 69.7. So there has been improvement between the last 10 years on the various key parameters, but they are not, they're not good enough because we've not been able to give healthcare to the entire population because they're still paying out of their pocket. So let's look at the constraints which are there. One is budget, which I've told you earlier, even though finance minister has said the last budget will go to 2.5% of GDP in 24, 25, but at the moment it's only 2.1. Doctor to population ratio in India is 1 is to 1600. WHO recommends 1 is to 1000. This 1 is to 1600 is pan India. So if you look at urban areas, if you look at cities, it is 1 is to 700. But in rural areas, it is 1 is to 1900 or 1800. Situation is worse. Similarly, for nurses, it is much higher than what WHO has recommended. So there's a constraint in this on manpower availability. Second, there are 30,000 hospitals in India, approximately, in public sector. But private hospitals are 44,000. And you look at the number of beds, it is 7.3 lakhs in public, 11.8 lakhs in private. So what happens if you have more private hospitals? Obviously, there are more beds also in the private hospitals. Out-of-pocket expenditure of the citizens increase because there are not enough beds in public hospital. There are not enough public hospitals. So people are forced to go to private hospitals where they will be expenditure more than what you would incur in a public hospital. Apart from that, the distribution of the hospitals is not uniform between urban and rural. I told you about manpower first. It is less, it is comfortable ratio in urban areas, but rural areas, it is much higher than what WHO is recommended. So the distribution is also skewed. And because of this problem, the low income groups are the worst affected. They cannot go to a private hospital because it'll be too expensive. When they go to a public hospital, it is too crowded. They have to manage with whatever is available. So the government started a new program in 2018 for their health care. And that is called, most of you know that, is Aishman Bharat. 
Now, very briefly on what it is, the Ayushman Bharat gives 5 lakhs per family per year. Through any hospital, it's cashless. It will be directly paid to the hospital. The government has identified about 10 crores families through socio-economic status, caste status. So far, 23 crores beneficiaries, including family members, have registered on this and they're taken benefit. Around 51,000 crores have been spent on this with about nearly 4.34 lakh hospital admission. The scheme is in progress in 25 states and eight union territories, but there are three states who are not joined the scheme. That is West Bengal, Orissa, and Delhi, because they must be having their own schemes, which are as good as this, or perhaps even better. So therefore, they are not joined Aishwan Bharat. Aishwan Bharat scheme is voluntary as far as state is concerned. Many states have joined this through a trust created in the state government or through linked with some insurance company and then they have made a part of it. But the fact is out of 28 states, 25 have joined and all unitaries of course have joined. In August 20, the government decided to go to a digital platform for Ishwan Bharat. So India took the first step to have a digital platform for healthcare in August 20. And we are almost there uh, three years later now. And the program has kick-started. And it all depends on whether we have been able to develop a good digital platform or not. So let us look at, have you been able to do it indigenously in India? Have you uh, been successful in the prototype trials in some places, etc.? We'll have a look at it. So the government wanted to uh, do this digital platform at national level. And they have been successful in Aadhaar, which has been issued for nearly 136 crores. COVID, they tracked the patients, uh, the citizens, and the vaccine program. About 220 crore vaccinations were done through COVID platform. So that gave them confidence. Then they made UPI, which is for real-time payment, which is accepted even in few countries abroad today, Oman, Singapore. Saudi, France, etc. So that gave them more confidence that they will be able to have a digital platform. Then they brought ONDC. Many of you may be knowing it. ONDC is uh, Open Network for Digital Commerce. They are competing with Swiggy and Zomato now so that they are able to get uh, many citizens given the uh, food service at a much lower rate than Swiggy and uh, Zomato. The government brought Gati Shakti for project management of infrastructure recently. And Aadhaar 2.0 is being built with blockchain technology with new features. It's already started, it's a voluntary one. If you've got Aadhaar now, you can go to Aadhaar 2.0, which will have uh, more features uh, of uh, your uh, biometrics as well as of your data. So. The government is very confident that they'll be able to make a digital platform for healthcare, even though uh, digitizing healthcare is not all that easy. And we will see why it is so. Many hospitals have done it. I've written a few hospitals which have already successfully done it. There's Ames, Delhi, Fortis, Apollo Hospital, Manipal Hospital, etc. They have done it. And most of them are in private domain, except Ames in Delhi. They have made digital systems for workflow. What does it mean? You go to a doctor, you already registered at the OPD, it is through the computer, you got a token, you go to the doctor, doctor will say, okay, go for an X-ray. He refers you to X-ray and the reference goes through the computer and you will be, just go to the X-ray room for your X-ray. When the X-ray is over, the digital X-ray will come back to the doctor and he'll be able to see it on the screen. So you don't have to wait for the X-ray to be washed, filmed, et cetera. And this has enabled many things to be, early detection has been, uh, been realized, faster diagnosis, some hospitals are also gone for telemedicine. So all these things the hospitals are doing, but they're all islands. 
if you go to one hospital you're hooked on to that digital network suppose today you go to apollo in delhi and tomorrow you are in uh, bombay or you are in mangalore and you want to go to manipal hospital all the data which is there in apollo delhi cannot reach manipal mangalore there's no interoperability so uh, you can say i do this was done you may have few details and the hospitals don't give you the full data they keep the data with themselves hoping that there will be a good reference when you go back again but you're not gone to the same hospital again you got to some other hospital so the data is not available to you and most of these facilities are urban based so rural people have got no benefit of this digital systems created in some of the uh, high class private hospitals so it remains largely as islands of excellence which have independent and they are not interoperable this poor data portability and interoperability has led to fragmentation of digital cover by coverage by hospitals every hospital has got some digital system but it's a stand alone you, you uh, it is not accessible from outside the hospital you cannot refer another doctor to it for him to have a look at your x ray or have look at your ultrasound is not possible so there is a need to make this data portable interoperable and that's a challenge for the doctors uh, i'm sorry for the people who are developing the digital systems so there is a need to standardize various digital protocols which can exchange data which can be accessible in rural india urban india etc so what the government has done is first they made a new authority called national health authority in 2019 and told them you please develop this digital platform with the best help from the designers in india and a year later the government started the mission called ayushman bharat digital mission in short form it's called abdm and i'll be referring to as abdm in subsequent slides so this was launched but this was launched after some initial work but the entire digital platform was not fully set up so how the platform has been made is any citizen who wants to volunteer to be a part of abdm he applies for a card called aba it's called aishwan bharat health account card you get a card which has got a code of 14 digit code your aadhar card for your benefit of understanding is 12 digits this is a 14 digit code which is given to you on this card with this card you are a member of the abdm now we are going to the last part of our talk abdm before i open the first slide i want to tell you in 2015 un had issued a composite document called sdg sustainable development goal out of which healthcare was one part based on it india issued the national health policy in 17 then they created the national health stack which is the digital system for uh, 2018 and then they launched abdm in 2020 so if you look at digital healthcare which we are trying to enter in india which you are trying to bring in in our rural and urban areas it is something similar to what has been done in many other countries let's look at the experience of many other countries more than 15 countries already set up this small countries like estonia bigger ones canada israel spain denmark and to some extent in usa uh, uk australia korea japan but if you look at uk australia korea japan they just completed last year and they took 6 years to do it because uh, they had many challenges when they were trying to get all their hospitals integrated through this digital platform so our hospitals number of hospitals and the number of citizens is much higher than any of these countries or all of these countries put together our challenges will be much more so one of the things which are happen simultaneously in the world every medical equipment which is being manufactured today will 
give the data only in a particular standard. Uh, there are some engineers in the audience. They will understand there's something called the IEEE standard. And that standard has to be followed so that your digital medical equipment is plug and play. Easily, it will the data will come to the server from where it can go, wherever it's supposed to go. And it'll also support wireless communication over Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. So medical equipment, our data portability is there and their interoperability is there if they are conforming to IEEE standards. But this standard has come only recently, about three years back. So equipment which have been made earlier may not conform to this. But all equipment here and after coming will have this, which will strengthen your digital platform. And as I told you, software is also being developed as medical devices. I give an example of a person who was uh, who had this problem of snoring, and they have been developed, which are compatible to the digital platform, and it enables better attendance by the duty staff when they're. So India's digital health mission, ABDM, which started in 2020, when will it finish? They've got a lot of area to cover. So let us look at what are the challenges in that. So the National Health Authority says objectives are very clear. Everybody knows objectives are inclusive, you know, accessibility, efficiency, affordability, and the data should be safe. So there are no doubts about the objectives of ABDM, which is what is required. Then what does the ABDM consist of? There are some building blocks uh, in ABDM. So let us look at it. The first building block, now here I would like to uh, tell you that it'll be slightly technical. So I'll go slowly so that you can absorb it. There'll be a registry of citizens. That means all citizens who have taken ABA card will be one data pool, one register of all the citizens who have joined ABDM. The second one is a, another register, or as they call registry, of all doctors, nurses, paramedics, dentists, uh, midwives, and uh, physiotherapists, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All people who are dealing with healthcare, they're the second registry along with their specialization. Obviously, every doctor has to join this. Either he joins voluntarily or he's asked to join. That we'll discuss a little later. But all the doctors in India put together will be in the second registry. And the third one is a registry of all the hospitals, clinics, blood banks, pharmacies, labs, scanning centers, along with their location. So there are three core blocks in ABDM. Citizen, healthcare professionals, healthcare facilities. Apart from that, there'll be something for all the drugs which are cleared in India for sales, along with along with all the details of medical shops. The fifth one is the personal health record of a patient. Now here I would like to emphasize the health record of a patient. Suppose you went for ECG to Trivandrum Medical College Hospital, which is the part of serial number three. And when you are an ABA holder, card holder, and your ECG is taken, and that ECG remains in the same hospital, it is where it was taken. It remains there. It doesn't leave that digital portal, but a link to that file is available with the patient. So patient can look at it whenever he wants. He may not be able to understand. He can show it to another doctor through the link. He can go to another doctor and that doctor through his hospitals can access and see this. So the personal health record of a person of an individual is with the hospital where it was generated. 
it may be an ultrasound, it may be a lab result, it may be an ECG, it may be an MRI, whatever it is. And the patient has to authorize somebody else to view it. It could be another doctor, it could be another hospital, it could be his uh, friend, it could be his relative, but he has to show, the, give the link to them so that they can view it. That is how the data is protected. It is just like you get your ECG in a piece of paper, you take it home, and you want to show it to somebody else, you show. If you don't want to show it, keep it in the cupboard. So the individual is responsible for making sure that he only his approval is required to show it to somebody else. Now, I will show you how the data flows today. The patient goes to a hospital, the doctor sees it, he, he, he is able to uh, visit the hospital, the doctor sees it, and all this medical data which I talked about are kept in respective hospitals. A part of it is given to the insurance company if it is required. But otherwise, this flow, which is from patient to the medical data, is an island in that particular hospital. It cannot be shared because of the various problems I told you. So you have, sorry, the consent of the patient is taken through another software called Consent Manager. And when, when all these are developed, you will realize the present silo model, silo model means it is an island, it's vertical, only within that hospital, will get shared to an open model through what is called UHI, Unified Health Interface. You remember UPI, through which you are paying GPay, phone pay, so many things which you're doing. Similar to UPI, UHI is going to be developed through which various interactions will take place. We'll have a look at it. So there's a UHI in the center. There are hospitals, nursing homes, doctors, and the citizens all around it, all are linked through UHI. So the technology principle, this is a slide, a slightly technical, so kindly bear with me. All the development is done through open source development. That means it is software is taken from open source. It is not some uh, patented software which is available only with a company. It's available in the internet. That is being used for developing this digital platform. To that extent, it is uh, easy to maintain. Second, all the core blocks will be centrally maintained by the government of India. That means government of India will have the list of citizens who have joined, will have the list of hospitals and the list of doctors and nurses, etc. Rest everything are done by state governments or by the hospital themselves. There'll be provisions for security audit and privacy, which will be done as a part of the program. Data will be validated every time. That means it is the genuine AVA card holder uh, and not somebody else who's trying to take out the data. And all blocks, which includes core blocks, plus the balance blocks of talk about consent and uh, other uh, personal health record, et cetera, all will operate through UHI. Now, now I'm going to show you how when UHI comes, the flow will change. So let me go to the next slide. So the UHI, the red block has come now. The patient will access UHI and he can take an appointment with the doctor, which is the green block. He can take an appointment with the hospital, which is the brown block, or he can go to the lab. He wants to take an appointment for scanning. He's taken through that. And the data output from the doctor or from the hospital or scanning center, all these are available only to only in their server. The concerned doctor can have a longitudinal data is how the patient's condition has changed over many months, etc. If he wants to do it, he'll be able to do it from 
provided the patient shares that link with him. And otherwise, the data remains in the scanning center or the hospital or the laboratory, uh, whatever be the place. Only the macro data goes to the government. That means how many people uh, had diabetic issues, how many people had heart problems, how many people had this type of uh, chicken gunia fever, all those macro data without details of who got it, uh, did, did it have a geospatial uh, concentration? Is it only in that particular village where you had this? Those sort of macro data will be available with the government. Of course, anything to be shared with a third person will have to be consented by the patient. Now, the ABDM has progressed this project in these three steps. And I thought this is a very fascinating uh, caption I want to share with you. They're thought big, they're thinking big, and they started small so that they can scale fast to wider coverage. So let's see how they have done it. The implementation strategy has been of course, issuing ABA card. They got the registry of professionals, hospitals, et cetera, populated with the efforts of state governments and UT, uh, union territory. While they were working on it, they realized there's an important factor for comfort of patients. They come in the hospital in the morning at 6.30, 7, thinking they will be able to see the doctor first in the OPD. They come early, they wait, for their number to be called. They go to the OPD counter, give their details, show the ABA card, that person enters it or reads that card, and then he refers to the doctor, they wait till such time the number is called. So what they have now done is, when the patient takes an appointment, he gets a QR code in his mobile. With that mobile, when he goes to the hospital, let's say his appointment is for 11 o'clock, he goes at 10.30 or 10.45 only, doesn't have to go early, and just shows the QR code. The computer reads it saying patient has come. And of course, you'll be called in at that time. So this has enabled quick service to the patient. Their waiting time has been significantly reduced. Uh, this has been tried out in some union territories and they found the results to be very, very good. And it been, the people, the citizenry is very happy with this new scan and share uh, program which has been made. Now they're also thinking of, they're continuing thinking big, they're going to make organ donation also possible through UHI after some time when it's fully tested. UHI has got enough budget, 140 per crores has been given uh, to be developed this and let's see how they have done it so far. So what they have done is they first did all the union territories Six union territories, not all, eight union territories, but they have taken six union territories and they did the phase one in union territories, which they completed, they got good results. When it came to phase two, they had faced problems uh, on developing issues like consent manager, when the patient gives a consent, how the data will get transferred to another doctor, another hospital, etc. So they are working on it. There's a technical paper which was made in December 22 by National Health Authority, and this will not resolve the issue. There are some glitches uh, which they have to do in phase two. But meanwhile, they are going to phase three saying, ABDM can go to all states. So as of now, all states, ABDM facility is open, even though the concern manager issue is still uh, pending. Now, let's look at the progress, how they have done. As of May 23, 38 crores ABA card has been issued, which is 28% of our population. 26 crores health records I got linked, which is about 19%. But only 1.63 lakhs doctors have joined. That is only 6% of the doctors, nurses, paramedics, physiotherapists, et cetera, et cetera, have joined ABDM. 94 percentage 
have not joined the digital platform, which means citizens cannot access them. You have to go and stand in line in the OPD. You can't take an appointment. You cannot have a telemedicine with them. And this is a serious problem because this aspect of doctors having to join ABDM through a respect, through a hospital or through a, a private clinic, what would be the thing? Any private clinic has got a license. Every hospital has got a license. So they have to quote that license and join. But for some reason, doctors and nurses and others are disinclined to join ABDM. You see the low percentage. And hospitals, only 18% of hospitals have joined. 82% of hospitals have not joined ABDM. So out of the three core sectors, citizens leave out the citizens. The balance two core sectors were very poorly populated from both doctors and hospitals. This is a serious issue. And how this has to be overcome is something which the central government and the state governments had to think about. We'll talk about it a little later. So while this has got released, WHO has come out on June 6th, that's about four days back, saying many countries should look at India, how they can have a digital health mission so that obviously is looking at countries which are not uh, the developed countries, the developing countries and less developed countries. He is encouraging them to look at how India has launched this, even though our result has not been very good. The benefits of ABDM are therefore are not being realized by citizens today. They're supposed to give easy access. It's happened. The doctors are supposed to give continuum of care through ABDM. It is not happening because doctors are not registered. So they expect the patients to come back to them to their clinic, come back to them to their hospitals. Most of them are staying out of this ABDM. Many, it is supposed to minimize the replication of tests on patients. That also may not have happened. The same test gets replicated uh, on the patient uh, by the labs or by the scanning centers. But one issue which has happened, interestingly, is telemedicine. And I'm going to show you how it has happened. Telemedicine has picked up in the last six months immensely in India. It has, it's called e-Sanjeevani. It has been developed by CDAC Pune. Nearly 10 crore patients have been served through telemedicine, their consultations. They're able to video conferencing uh, you, along with you. This is primarily done from a primary health center. So the primary healthcare assistant is sitting next to you and you say, I got a red mark here. So the doctor is able to see you through, um, see you through the video conferencing, or you are, the doctor wants to know how is your uh, uh, blood pressure for something else. So the healthcare assistant who's sitting next to you takes the blood pressure and tells the doctor, and this is it. And then he talks to you more, and thereafter he advises you uh, the treatment, uh, how it has to be progressed. So this is actually picked up, especially in rural areas where people have to travel a lot of distance to see a doctor. While the primary health center, they are able to see the assistant. The doctor doesn't turn up or the doctor is absent. They are able to speak to another doctor in another center or in a nearby hospital. And they are able, this has saved time and cost by nearly 30%. So one of the benefits of ABDM has been on telemedicine. Uh, in fact, most you will see 57 percentage of the 10 crore, that means more than nearly six crore have been seniors, have been women. They find it difficult to leave their home and go to a hospital which is far away and be away from home for many hours in the day. So they go to the nearby health center and from there, they are able to 
to video conferencing with the doctor on the other side. 57% has been women and 12% have been senior citizens. And that's how the savings have come and they have been able to practice uh, uh, telemedicine with the doctor. Uh, this has happened very well. This, uh, as I told you, this has been coordinated by the primary health center, which have been reworded as wellness center. And based on the results and based on the experience, CDAC is modifying this e-Sanjeevani to 2.0 so that there are some more uh, features can be added to it. Now, I'm sorry. Uh, now, as I told you, ABDM should only create digital records of the concerned the patient, but the concern manager software is in phase two is still not ready. Hopefully it should get. Medical insurance also will get introduced through this, integrated through this. So many times insurance claims which are forwarded insurance companies presently don't tally with the case sheet of the patient or the actual illness of the patient. Now there is a history to that and it is auditable, it is traceable and it can be looked into by agencies. Otherwise insurance companies were paying a lot of money uh, based on the documents which are submitted. So what is the shift has been earlier our medical treatment, our healthcare has been evidence-based planning has come now and government has been able to uh, make fresh policies to make sure the wellness centers, which is the basic healthcare unit, is able to participate more meaningfully with the patient, with the population, especially in rural areas. So I told you some time back, digitizing health is like running like a marathon and not a sprint. If the government thought it is a sprint when they launched in 20, in 23, they have not reached the destination. Other countries have taken six to seven years, advanced countries, developed countries. But I think we are running a marathon and let's look at what are the challenges we are facing. The first challenge is internet availability in rural in areas, not all rural areas have. Interoperability I talked to you about, but this will get overcome only in a few years time when new equipment which are having this interoperability feature will kick in. There's a worry about security and privacy of patient data. And this can be overcome only with people getting convinced that their health data is not getting compromised. There is a disinclination amongst doctors to come onto the platform, as well as hospitals. And this can happen only if uh, some coercion some persuasion takes place through the hospitals on the doctors that they have to make this themselves available to a general public, to the general citizen. If a general citizen asks for an appointment, you can say you're not free and don't give an appointment, but the fact is you have to be on the platform so that you're accessible to the citizen and he can try to contact you and try to meet you. You cannot close your door and say, I'm not joining the platform. So there is some issue of morality here of the doctor. This needs to be looked into in a little more detail by the central government and state government. We'll touch upon this in any of the Q&A aspects. And the design has to be very user-friendly. That's very clear. So when this ABDM comes, the shift is actually from episodic case, episodic care. Somebody had a heart attack, it's an episode, and everybody attends to that patient. But now, with telemedicine available, with rural health centers, wellness centers connected, pe people are getting advice on long-term management right before an episode occurs. So as this condition is slowly deteriorating, 
The doctor is able to advise him, correct his habits, give him some treatment if required a hospitalization. But the fact is, it is not a sudden episode which has happened. So there's a shift happening slowly from episodic care to long-term management proactively. And the trust between the patient and doctor has slowly started increasing in rural areas, especially through telemedicine. This is the challenge which the government saw it will be difficult to generate and build, but I think they have made some beginning in this area. But what they have not been able to do is doctors not coming on board, hospitals not coming on board, thereby shutting their door to ABDM, which is otherwise having citizens waiting on the other side of the door. So let us look at what is the future of ABDM. Future of ABDM is definitely like in other countries, uh, other uh, digital health missions, artificial intelligence is going to come. Uh, they feel, many developed countries feel the burnout and fatigue of doctors will reduce. Remote monitoring is possible through wearables and ingestibles. Evidence-based management will enhance. Robotic caregivers will come. Software as medical devices. Cost saving in a big way. And US expects a cost saving of $250 billion a year after two, three years. Well, it's not fully set up US digital health mission, but they feel a lot of time and money will get saved, which will amount to $250 billion. And another aspect about uh, digital health missions like ABDM, healthcare data will bring in automatically big data analytics into it. Healthcare data as such has got what is called four Vs. There's a huge volume of healthcare data, the veracity is uh, important. The velocity with which it changes, data change is also important. And there's variety as well. So all these needs to be duly protected. Privacy has to be accorded. So big data analytics has got a huge challenge when it comes to healthcare, but they feel that they'll be able to overcome. And the future, you will be able to get not only macro data from the digital health module platform, but also be able to bring in artificial intelligence modules, which will help in doctors spending more time with the patient. They won't get fatigued out seeing too many patients. The government has taken initiative to protect the data and the privacy of a patient. And they have uh, brought a new law, which I'm told, which I read, that it will uh, come to the parliament in July 23. It is called Digital Information for Healthcare Act. So DISHA, as it is the short form, it is expected that this digital info security for healthcare will get discussed in parliament. And that will also overcome one of the challenges which ABDM is facing today. So if Disha comes, privacy and security will get addressed. Telemedicine has already made some good beginning. If doctors and hospitals can come on board, then ABDM can start moving forward. Otherwise, it is not moving forward. You're running a marathon, but your steps are very, very small. So with this, let me go to the conclusions. I've already told you 42% is by government and rest comes out of pockets. It's a huge burden on citizens. Uh, our public health has improved the last 10 years, but the distribution of healthcare facilities and professionals is skewed, which needs to be overcome. New technologies to render healthcare is important and has become inevitable for us to introduce this. And many countries have gone to digital health is a fusion of healthcare and digital technology. 
India has all, also launched a Think Big mission, ABDM, in 19. It started small in the six union territories. It has scaled fast to states, but cooperation from uh, hospitals and medical uh, fraternity has fallen short. It is hoped the ABDM has been accepted by 36, 36 crore citizens, one fourth of our population, will start becoming popular when the doctors and hospitals also come on board. There could be a reason why they're not coming on board. And I'm sure some of the doctors in the audience will uh, share that aspect with, with us today. Uh, and the challenges faced by ABDM is not unexpected by many because it's a marathon and not a sprint. And we hope we'll be able to complete uh, ABDM in its full measure uh, at least by 2030 in another seven years' time because we haven't really covered much. So let's hope that we will be able to not only set up ABDM in our country by 2030 in full measure, but also guide many other less developed countries as also uh, commented upon by WHO during this period between now and 2030. With this, I have concluded my presentation. Um, Jai Hind to all of you and thank you very much. If there are any questions, I'm prepared to take. I'm stopping my